Amen. But in true PTI style, Prophet will bombard the doctor with some questions and hopefully she'll be able to answer me. Amen. So many questions that are there. Servant leadership. Certainly not a new concept as it has been um, showcased for us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the order of things. And we see just through this presentation how the church has strayed significantly from servant leadership. Now, let me tell you a story before I start questioning. I remember I was at a particular place and um, I was um, leading the charge in that place. So um, one day I went to my office and um, I realized that the church was dirty from um, our services that we held prayer. And my office was also dirty. So I didn't call anyone to clean my office. I just simply took the broom and I went and I swept my office. I found that to be my duty, my obligation. I am the one using the office. So why can't I clean it? So um, as I was sweeping, one of the ladies of the church looked at me and said, oh, pastor knows how to use a broom. He can sweep. I said, mm-hmm. I said in my mind, mm-hmm. This one has truncated their stay. And <laughs> I, as I said it, it happened shortly after that person's stay was truncated. Why? Why did that happen? I understood my role as a servant that no task is greater than me to be done, to be accomplished. Even if it meant cleaning the toilet and it needed cleaning, I would take the brush and clean it. But here is where God draws the line. When people begin to mock his servants because of what they do, whether that task is menial, as Doc was saying, or whether that task is great, don't matter the extent of the task, his servants will not be mocked because they serve him first before they serve others. And I want to put out a warning to those who feel as if they can abuse, they can um, use, they can distress um, God's servants mock them, insult them, simply because they are serving and displaying the attitude of service and serving and servanthood more than they display the attitude of leadership as some would uh, display it today. I have found that when you demonstrate this level of leadership through service people tend to look down on you people tend to think you are weak that you hold no clout that you are nothing in the eyes of others and they seek to treat you accordingly and uh, simply because there is a deficit in the way we have discipled people and in the way people have been taught. I don't know how much of, or many of you have ever sat under a teaching about serving, servanthood, service. Um, much of what is going on today is leadership, empowerment to lead, you understand, but not service. And I believe that this is certainly um, a, a lesson uh, that is required to be taught to nowadays um, leaders so that they understand first and foremost what they are ought to be in Christ. So Doc, here my first question. How do I get the nature of a servant? 
how, how, how do I get that? I want to lead, but I need to be a servant. How do I get that? Yeah, green. If if we were to go off Greenleaf's teachings, Greenleaf says that this the the desire to lead is, or you know, the nature of the servant is intrinsic, is innate. Mm -hmm. So it's the real you. It's a part of your makeup. As much as your eyes are brown, you can't do anything about it. So that servant nature is the real you is not something that is assumed or you know is bestowed upon you thou art a servant um so in that respect according to greenleaf you get the nature of a servant from birth um or from you know whatever shapes you your environment that shapes you um but if we were to look at servant leadership uh, from the spiritual aspect with Jesus Christ, this, they, um, the nature of a servant comes from being a follower of Christ. Okay. A follower of Christ. When we were kids, kids follow people and they do everything. My daughter used to wear my heels. I used to pray for her ankles. She used to, you know, want to use my makeup and, 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 Put on my clothes because she was following me she was trying to do what i did and that's what we do as jesus jesus was a servant and so we get that <clears throat> nature of a servant when we follow him amen amen i i agree with you right there and Certainly. may i add and one of the things i i i, I would I, I really believe that the reason why a lot of us as leaders don't um, display that servant, that nature of a servant is because, well, one, if we don't know Jesus, we can't do it. So we might be, you know, parading as if we know him, but we really don't know him. So that's why we don't have that um, nature. But there are those of us who really know him. But I believe that we can stifle that, you know, that, that urge. We can, uh, that feeling that desire, we can stifle it. And I think I think a lot of people stifle it out of pride, out of ego, out of whatever reason. So, you know, but I believe that once you know Jesus Christ, if you're not born that way, you know, just to serve, then once you know Jesus Christ, that nature comes inside of you, but you can also stifle that nature. Okay, great. So for me to be, to get the nature, I must follow Christ. Very good. Now, I want to draw our attention. I asked that question deliberately because mm -hmm. I wanted to draw our attention to something in the scriptures in Matthew chapter four and um, verse eight to 10. Mm -hmm. In Matthew chapter four, verse eight to 10. In fact, this is the first place that the word serve is mentioned in the New Testament. The New Testament. So we have a saying in theology, law of first mention. Mm -hmm. it, carries the foundational meaning throughout. Now, I want to point this out because this is very important for us to, to hear and learn and understand. And um, what Dr. Thomas said is going to be shown in this scripture. Matthew 4, verse 8, the devil take him to an exceeding high mountain. Note, note, note where the devil took him, high mountain place of prominence, mm -hmm. influence, mm -hmm. power, prestige, fame, all of that is high mountain. Levels. That's what leaders of today want to emulate and where they want to be, high mountain. Good? Mm -hmm. Now, and show them all the kingdoms of the world. We want to be above people and the glory of them, all that comes with it. And said unto them, all of these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Hmm. Now, this is the key here. Leaders of today, and I want us to pay attention because this is serious. Leaders of today, not all, some. What is their driving uh, force? What is driving them? 
And no matter how we spiritualize it, listen, if the thing is wrong, it is wrong. The driving force behind their leadership is high mountain acquisition. <clears throat> high mountain acquisition. The fame, the power, the pomp, the glory, the materialism. Mm -hmm. High mountain acquisition. And all of that can be acquired in this world. All of that can be acquired in this world. But here is Jesus' response. And we, we need to take note of what Jesus says in the Bible. Mm -hmm. He doesn't speak a lot, but when he speaks, he speaks volumes. He said, get thee hence, Satan. In other words, your high mountain mentality. I don't want it. For it is written, this is what God says. This is the father's um, paradigm, principle, root. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And him only shalt thou serve. It seems as if service is directly connected to worship. And that you cannot be a servant if you do not have the nature of a worshiper. Hands down, plain down, simple. You cannot be a servant if you have not the nature of a worshiper. So the question is then, <laughs> am I a worshiper? And this is where it becomes cloudy because people think that a worshiper is one who sings. And that's where it is wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're not a worshiper because you can sing. You are a worshiper, here it is, because you have surrendered your will to God. And a servant is not his own master, but somebody else's, which means you don't have a will. Well, let me play. Doc will say it for you nicely. Me, I blunt. You <laughs> don't have a will. You don't have a testament. Well, you don't have a will. You don't have a desire you, to, to, to do your own thing. Your desire, your will, your testament is to do what God wants. That is the heart of a worshiper. Yeah. Rooted in the desire to serve. So how do you get the heart, the nature of a servant? By becoming God's worshiper. Mm -hmm. How do you become God's worshiper? By being a follower of Jesus Christ. It is intertwined, mm -hmm. simple, intertwined. So we now bring this into church. Let's bring it into church. What we see in church does it equate to what the scriptures demand? Mm. Does it equate, brethren? And we can evaluate, and I'm sure you are now evaluating your pastor, your apostle, your prophet, your whoever that is leading you, these teachings. If, if it is not leading you to evaluate, you are wasting your time, honestly. It leads you to evaluate, not just them, but yourself. Because some of you say, oh, I'm called, God is calling me. God is calling you to do what? The first thing God is calling you to do is to serve. Full He's stop. Mm -hmm. He's not calling you to be no apostle, no prophet, no pastor, no teacher, no evangelist, no ambassador, no, no high priestess. He's calling you first to serve. And if you cannot do that, then no title will be afforded to you. Because the title is a description of your service. Simple. So if you are being called to serve, then you have to evaluate yourself now and see, do I have the nature of a servant? And if I don't have the nature of a servant, I need to go back to Calvary 
and, and, and born again, born again. And then go back down to the water and get rebaptized. This time with your mouth open and your eyes wide open. Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that you can learn to lose your will to another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Dr. Thomas, what do you do if a leader is not committed to your personal growth? Mm. What do you do if you are in a place and a leader is not committed to your personal growth? Talk to us, please. Go. Get the hands. Get the hands. Mm. Mm. We're in the kingdom to grow, to impact, to be impacted for impact. Yes. If you're not being... I love how you said that. Say it again. You, you, we are in the kingdom to be impacted for impact. impact. Mm. Now, as a leader, it is my responsibility to pour into those whom God has entrusted in my care. Mm -hmm. If I have a leader who's not doing that, if I'm growing beyond my leader, if my leader is not fostering and encouraging my growth, then it is my responsibility, I believe, because my walk with God is personal. It is my responsibility to find somewhere else that will foster my growth, that will, you know, prepare me for impact. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, simply get the hands. And this don't require no fasting and prayer. Really? I mean, unless you're going to fast and pray for him to change. <laughs> Boy. Mm -hmm. If you're happy drinking milk, that, all the days of your life. Go ahead. Stay there. Drink mm -hmm. milk. Yes. But if you're growing, you're growing teeth, you're developing, you want, you're seeing things, you want to explore. You want to, you want, you, you have this desire to, I mean, God, there's a big world out there. There's a harvest field. Then get up and do something. Yes. Mm -hmm. For your own personal salvation and righteousness. Yeah. And, and, it, and it simply means that you cannot subject yourself to somebody who has nothing to pour into you no you can't mm -hmm. if you were to go to school mm -hmm. and every day your teacher comes and files her nails or mm -hmm. trims his beard looking in the mirror what would you do i would call that one uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you wouldn't sit in that class you would not want to sit in that class mm -mm. in college we have options to choose our um instructors yes sometimes we're in a in a lecture group and we're just not getting from this instructor so we go to the office and we say hey we'd like to change our instructor we'd like yes. to go to this class because we have that power we have that option and i believe it's the i believe it is um the same thing in the kingdom what, what's the use of sitting under somebody who is not pouring into you he's not you know fostering your growth your development mm -hmm. No, I'm it's going to go down this road. No, my bicycle already gone down this road and I'm going down, down it down, down that. Full, speed, mm -hmm. full speed ahead. You're saying that in the kingdom, mm -hmm. and I think people miss this, mm -hmm. the kingdom of God and his dear son, Jesus Christ, of which I am a part, you're a part, he, she, and the old lady is a part. If somebody is not fostering my growth, I have the power within me to make a decision to go where I can grow. Whether or not they vex or they don't vex. Well, Prophet Bernard, you know I'm a very practical person. Please practicalize us. Um, <laughs> somebody's going to be vexed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the pastor mm -hmm. gonna be vexed if I leave. I'm gonna be vexed if I stay. Right? Mm -hmm. So I must choose my vex. <laughs> choose your vex. I love this. 
the, the pastor is going to be vexed if you go. You are going to be vexed if you stay. The so, stay. So, so, so choose your vexed. <laughs> but, I love it. Yes. I mean, what, what is this? Where's my loyalty though? Yes. Is it is it is it to my pastor leader or is it to God? Do I yes. owe it to God to be the best being, to be the best impact? To you know, do I owe my loyalty, my faithfulness to God, mm -hmm. or do I owe it to my pastor leader? You know, it's it's funny you said that because let's back up what we're saying with scripture. Let's people think that we are just joking around. No, we make humor. We, we have to make fun of, of humor of things. Uh -huh. John and Jesus. John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. John was a teacher. When we did history, he was from the group called the Essenes. And those sets of people, um, you can research them. They separate themselves they learn the torah they believe that they are holy and righteous john had an arrogant righteousness about him and that he feels like he can speak to anybody about anything because him not doing it full stop is arrogant righteousness but andrew was his disciple and when john um when jesus was revealed to john John said, go follow him. Go and learn from him. He's the one. He's the one you need now, not me. He's the one that will take you to the next level. So run after him. Now, we, we don't find that kind of mentality in the, in, in the body right now. What you find is that if, if a person don't have, let's say I am spiritual warfare and the prophetic, right? And um, I see a lot of things being taught out there about spiritual warfare and I cringe in my little toe because I'm like, what on God's green planet earth are these people going on with? That is nothing but spiritism, superstition, enchantment, demonism, you name it. But we have to do what God wants us to do first before we can touch certain things. So now, John left for us a pattern that, look, if I don't have something, call him somebody, no man, to help you. You're not, you're, you're not the entire dictionary. Exactly. You're not the entire Bible. Call in somebody to help in that area. Lest you make a fool of yourself by teaching that subject. And honestly, if I if I am in a place, listen, when, when you hit 40, you know, things change in your head. There's a switch that turn on. Because mm -hmm. you realize that you 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 don't have time now for foolishness. All of you under 40, you soon reach. When you hit 40, there's a switch that turn on in your head where you say to yourself, I am done with the crap. Yep. Enough of nonsense. Right, but you don't have to reach 40 to get there. What you need is an understanding of the scripture. You cannot sit down under somebody who is spiritually lower than you, intellectually lower than you. Come on, in wisdom and in understanding, lower than you, and expect to grow from that individual. Honestly, you are going to be frustrated yeah. or you don't frustrate that individual. Yeah. You need to be at a place where the, the leader is constantly growing and through that growth can pour into you so that you too can grow. Mm -hmm. I hear some people, you know, I'm going to say some stuff tonight. I hear some people making some statements about Oh, uh, Bible school is not, is not necessary. It's the anointing. Who told you that crap? Mm. Who told you that rubbish? You need Bible school to learn the laws of hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. You need Bible school to learn how to construct a sermon so that you don't start teaching me about um, faith and you end up down at love. Mm. That's still good. <laughs> with shoes but yeah 
You, you understand? And, and I'm seeing a lot of that going on. We need structure. We need order. We need different levels of development so that we can grow in grace and become the kind of servant that God wants. What is lacking in many of us is not the desire to serve, you know. It's the know-how. And if you don't have someone who can take you through systematically and say, hey, this is how you shear the sheep. You have never sheared sheep in all your life. And you might take a, you might take a, a, a shear and dig out the sheep flesh because you don't know how to hold the shear at an angle to shear the sheep so that him don't get cut and, 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 and full of sores and then fly take him over. You need to know the know-how. So it's not just, oh, I am called by God and God is calling me and, and I feel the anointing. You might, you might very well be feeling the annoying <laughs> rather than the anointing. Because some, some people are annoying, honestly speaking. They're annoying with their anointing, saying that they are serving, when actually there is high mountain mentality they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. High mountain mentality. So what do you do? Well, the simple answer is run. Run and find somebody Get that can pour ends. into you. Get the ends. Mm -hmm. It's a simple thing. Let's not sugarcoat this. Get the ends. We don't care who I'm vexed. Somebody mm -hmm. got vexed and it's not me. Yeah. But we just need to get to that point where Paul reached in, in his letter to the Galatians. He said, I'm not here to please man. Mm -mm. I'm here to please God. If, if I were here please, to please man, do you think I'd be a, 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 a slave of Christ, a bond servant of Christ? Uh -huh. So, no. I mean, we could sit in that situation and just be a slave to that situation, a slave to that leader. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where you, where, God, where you can be really impactful, where God can use you in the field, you know, field is drying up and you, you're yes. not you're not reaping anything you're not benefiting the kingdom wow so get wow. out get out don't be that's the thing Rep, um prophet i just believe that we're at this stage now in 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 the world and um god i mean jesus is coming soon we just don't have time there is just so much vices out there so much mess that we can't be, we, we have to start taking the bulls by the horn. We have to start, you know, be violent. Be violent about our Christian growth, our walk, our salvation, our righteousness, our calling, our gifting. We just have to be that violent about it. We just can't, we can't be passive anymore. Mm -hmm. Not in this day and age. Not when there is so much. There is no way that anyone should be seated in a church under a leader that is not pouring into you, that is not um, seeking and working and, and, and building you, your growth, your development in the kingdom. It really should not happen. We cannot, we cannot be passive anymore. There's just so much to do out there. Yes. So we just have to make that decision. We have to just be practical Christians. We're yeah. not we're not calling, please, we're not calling for rebellion. No. We're not calling for disorder. Mm -mm. We're just saying if it needs to be done, don't sit and suffer. Yes. Don't, you know, if it needs to be done, do it prayerfully and respectfully. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when they curse you, come, I will remove it. Mm -hmm. yeah. when the curse you come i'll remove it you see we must have the nature of a lamb and the mentality of a lion okay. so in other words you're a lamion yes mm -hmm. a lamion a lion and a lamb a lamb and a lion anyway a lamion amen glory to god Question. <laughs> Prophetess Labina, come let's hear from you <laughs> yes. come on lamion <laughs> amen Go ahead, Prophetess. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prophet. And thank you, Reverend Nadine, for such a profound teaching, woman of God, from since you have started. Um, it's quite clear and, you know, very relatable indeed. 
um, as a leader in your own right, you know. Um, Prophet Bernard, I think we have to take that, um, you know, that order from you that you don't go first. Amen? Because when you go first, you ask all the questions. Um, <laughs> woman of God, um, good night to everyone on the platform. Good night, everyone. Um, clearly, um, it seemed that, you know, leaders has eclipsed from their position. They have elapsed from their position. Amen? Um, as first as a servant. And I've realized that a lot of leaders, um, you, you touched on the pyramid, you showed the, the pyramid of a servant leader. And I've realized that a lot of leaders, one of God, they don't teach you how to lead. They don't help you in that regard. But what they do is that they want to be the one to do everything. They delegate, they don't delegate anything, but they are the ones that um, are responsible for everything that they do within that mm -hmm. ministry, within that um you know, group where they are the ones leading. And one of the things that I've realized is that, um, you know, leaders want, and I'm all over the place here because I'm, I'm trying to bring it back. As I said, Prophet Bernard asked all the questions and now I'm just trying to piece back the questions together to make <laughs> the question, right? right. Um, yeah, so I'm saying that um, one of the things that I've realized because of that, you know, they do everything and they don't delegate to develop or to help their people or you know persons in ministry now one of the things i've realized as a leader my, myself um the quickest way to help or to help develop is to delegate because when you delegate you give persons that sense of um you know sense of leadership um authority that they in turn can able to do what is it that they need to do to um if, if they want if they're fearful whatever that they're dealing with at the time you you know you can help eliminate that by giving them the authority mm -hmm. um to do certain tasks right mm -hmm. um you know i've learned um from a very sincere a pioneer a leader that um i work alongside and i've learned from that leader that a good leader raise leaders amen a good leader um, construct and develop leaders. And that is something that I, I see that we lack here in, you know, when I say here, I mean, no, in this time, um, you don't have a lot of leaders that are delegating. You have a lot of leaders that are molding, that are empowering, that are shaping. You have leaders who want to stand in their place of authority and want to ensure and maintain that that place of authority is seen and known but not if a servant had, for sure. Um, there is something that you made mention of. You said that a lot of times it is driven by power and not because you have a heart to serve. And you see that, you see that. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that I said today that I'm very scared for the generation to come mm -hmm. because you know, um, a lot of these teachings, a lot of, you, you see a lot of apostles raising up. You see a lot of bishops raising up in their early mm -hmm. 20s who have never been processed, who have never been for anything. Mm -hmm. And they raise up and they see that they are leaders and they are they are those are leading people. But you can clearly see that their motive is power, is authority to be seen, to be known, you know, um, to be in the spotlight. And, you know, that is something that I've realized that a lot of leaders have been driven by, by, you know, being in the spotlight, by being seen. They call themselves celebrity you know, celebrity leaders. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the secular um, leadership is being crept into the church, mm -hmm. into the church body. And it no longer become godly leadership, but it become leadership where it's all about, you know, um, how, I'm being, how I'm being seen in the secular field, because they, they, they don't just want to um, save souls or to bring persons into Christ, but they want persons who see them as okay i'm mr I'm, I'm bishop bernard um thomas and you know i am i have signs and wonders flowing through my every time i speak when my i go on a platform and speak you know devils run and that, that's what they want to be yeah. affiliated with them and not that they are a leader you know so how do you woman of god that's my question to you i'm gonna <laughs> how do you address um you know when you know one of the things that I've okay before I ask that question, let me just okay. say, say um one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of persons are um motivated and are drawn to this type of leadership. Um, I've noticed that there's a lot of itchy ears. There's a lot of people who are 
you know, they don't, they're not grounded in the world. They are not grounded in principles. So they are easily drawn into this type of leadership. How do you um, bring that message across to the, the, the young people who are coming up as future leaders? that they will not be blindsided by this type of leadership. I know that is something that is, I know it's a, it's a, it's a maybe a question. <laughs> because, and you're right, because this generation that we have dealing with now, these so-called millennials, uh. They're in a whole world by themselves. They're, okay. they're in their own space. Nothing else exists out there. What they think is right, what they believe is right, what they do is right. So, you know, I mean, and it's very easy to see why. I mean, this is, this is an era of glitz and glamour. So, I mean, the pastor leader who presents himself with all this glitz and all this glamour and he's this, you know, this cool dude and he's, you know, this charismatic guy and he just speaks and it happens and, you know, that kind of thing, the flair and the, the fashion and the flash, that is what attracts. How do we get our young people and young adults not to be attracted to that? Prophet Bernard. <laughs> because that, that, I mean, oh. Oh, wow. Well, the first thing is, let's start praying for this generation. First, let's Simple. start praying. That's, that's where it starts. Hands down. Secondly, um, let's be deliberate about who we endorse and appoint into leadership. Yeah, but how much influence do we have over that? Well, because the uh, truth of the matter is we are as okay in our let me ask a question to both of you yes. in ours and to everybody else on the platform in, in our sphere of influence as leaders how many people who are like that is a part of our network that we have any kind of influence over in terms of even to say hi to say um you know you need to calm down just, just give any kind of advice how many mm -hmm leaders do we have and that's that's that really is the challenge mm -hmm. how do we get to them yeah that I, yeah you are, you are, you, your question is, is is to the point um but I, I i think though that god will will give some level of influence um by virtue of his authentication of our serving and our work in him and thereby we will begin to develop some level of influence and eventually reach a place where we can say okay here here is something i need to say to you for yeah. our sake right um maybe you might not reach a place that i reach but i might get there and i might say to them hey look you know we need to talk about servant leadership and I have the right person to bring to you to talk about that. You understand? So uh, I have to be willing to open the door to others that God is giving a revelation for the now, you know, and, and, and others I think should, you know, be willing to do the same. Um, for instance, um, I met the leaders of Kingdom Embassy just at one conference that I went to and they say, hey, come. You understand? We need mm. you. You know, we need you to do this for us. I said, give me some time. Let me pray. I prayed. God said, no, this is what you should do for them. You understand? Mm. And I went back and I said, this is what the Lord wants me to do. And they say, okay, come. And right. I mean, you know, the teaching now is reaching a wider space and a wider scale of uh, scope of people right it, that, that's influence and i believe it's it's influencing i don't know to the extent of you know how much but i know it is so it it, right. it begins from your willingness to want to do it and to allow god to open the door for you to do it not to force it on them but to open the door for you to do it and in your space whatever space you have um 
you know, be that influence right. up, upon them. Um, there are some things that I've done in the past that I will not do again. You understand me? Um, and I've learned my lessons from that. Mm -hmm. And going forward, I will never make that kind of mistake again in my life, right? Because, you know, you realize the, the, the tragedies that it has, it has caused, right? And all of us, if we are honest as men and women of God, whether you're a bishop or whatever, we have made mistakes in endorsing and appointing people mm -hmm. that are not ready. Yeah. That should have been sitting at your feet, learning, mm -hmm. and, and don't come to me with the nonsense about, oh, God has called me. God call everybody, including Balaam Donkey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So right. The, 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 that should not be the, 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 the driving force behind we endorsing and appointing people. Yeah. I think we have been the problem and we need to fix it, honestly speaking. Yeah. And your example that you gave is basically the other point. The point I was going to make to butcher what you said. Mm -hmm. We, I think all we can do um, is to be that example, like uh, that alternative for these young people or, you know, these millennials. Just be that best example, that best imitator of Christ as we can as leaders so they will see that this alternative and you know because the truth is people you know who were born in this era millennials i hate to say that word it gives me tight tongue <laughs> millennials <laughs> they are um they are very analytical they analyze everything they probe into things so um, they will, if we, if we who know better will do better mm -hmm. and be that real imitator of Christ, as Paul said, we should be, then believe you me, they'll start to take notice and they will now begin to compare and they will do their research because they research everything. Yes, they so. do their research and then they will have that alter. So basically what we can do is offer an alternative for them. Amen. Amen. The truth of the matter is a lot of um, these passes that you've described are going into the laser fear style of leadership that is so very attractive to millennials because they love to be free. They are born as independent people. As babies, they were never told no. As babies, they were never told, you know, you can't do that. And there's a difference. There's black and there's white. There's right. They were never told that. So they were open to everything. Explore. And so when a pastor comes up as a laser fear leader, oh, you come, you know, whatever goes, as long as Jesus is here. Sometimes he's not even in the roof. But, you know, that attracts them. So if we can be that solid imitator, then that's an alternative that we can offer to them. A moment ago, thank you so much. Um, just before I leave, I just want to um, make a comment statement. Um, you know, even as we were talking about earlier, as I mentioned about delegation in regards to um, delegating, right? Um, to able to develop and to motivate and to help. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've noticed though, um, and I've I've been I've I've been in a, in in a place like that, where um, leaders would not pour into you, and they would close the ministry when they are leaving, mm -hmm. um, instead of having leaders being developed and you know leave them in charge in certain areas so that they can function in the giftings that God has called them. They would close the ministry and they would not delegate authority to anyone. But I've realized too, again, some of the older leaders or those who have gone before, um, I've seen as well that they heard their, their position, they heard their pulpit, they heard you know, um, the grace because they figure out that you know, a younger person is coming or a new leader is coming, that person might be functioning in a, grace that might outshine and it should not be that it should not be it about be. outshining it's about you know every grace come together coupled together and every joint will supply but you know i've realized that you know that every joint will supply 
is not something that you know they are taken is taken um literally this is one joint will supply and you have to feed it from that joint you know <laughs> so um you know what is your take on that woman of god um Absolutely. I believe that delegation, listen, a pastor, and I think I mentioned it, I spoke about it last week, a pastor leader who can delegate is one who is strong, who is secure in his ability as a leader, who is secure in his position. Um, definitely delegation helps to develop um, the, the an individual it encourages it motivates it's it inspires because a servant leader is one who duplicates himself into others jesus christ that's what he did by the time he left there were 12 jesus christs wandering you know across the, the globe and then there was the other 70 70 that was yeah wandering exactly. 70 jesus christs uh, because he he multiplied, he you know right. imparted himself into them. So what he could do, they could do, and even more. Right. So um, that's really what a pastor leader is supposed to do if we're a follower of Christ. That's what Christ did. That's what we should do. So delegation not only helps the individual to whom you delegate their responsibility. But it also helps the leader himself because the more I give away is the more that I have to have room to get. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So when like I give that. you that responsibility, then it frees me to hear from God. Okay, God, what next? And he pours more into me. But when you hug everything, then you're stagnant. I am stagnant. The church is stagnant. The community is stagnant. I mean, but but the thing you think about it is that I've realized though that they love the stagnancy. They because do if they're because not caught, if, if they're not caught in edge, it makes them feel relevant, right? It makes them feel relevant. It gives them that yeah. security, that control. It's all about control. It gives one that, that that yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I'm telling you, it's, um, I have been in situations where, and, and Prophet Bernard will attest to that because, you know, he knows a lot, that I've been in situations where, okay, so a particular ministry was delegated to someone lead, but as soon as it begins to take off and the mm -hmm. membership and even people from outside begin to you mm -hmm. know, talk about it or to um, comment, even commend it. It was just ripped away. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're shutting this down. Okay, you know, and yeah. I, I mean, yeah. not only to me, but I've heard <laughs> several people who whose that has happened to. Yeah. As soon as it begins, to, you begin to get some kind of recognition as mm -hmm. a leader of that little part That's of it. ministry. Yeah. It's it's shut down. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that that's not healthy for anybody. That really is not healthy. That's not what Jesus, you know, hoped for for his the leaders of his flock. Well, woman of God, I I, I can testify. Just not prophet. I can testify to that because I've been I've been in that position so mm -hmm. many times. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can I can write a book about that. Okay, so I know I can attest to that. You know, just having just having been through certain experiences in life has shaped me to be a better leader today Absolutely. and and we thank god for you know these processes we thank god for you know having to walk that path so that we can able to lead from a place of experience which is in turn wisdom from god yeah. yes prophet amen amen wow this is this is serious there's so much we can say right here but let's give others a little chance to ask yes. their question so that uh, we don't take up all the time. Brother Howie, come. Let's see what you have to say to us tonight. Amen. Yes, good night again. Um, night. My question is, as a leader, what do you do when you have a youngster who you identify a lot of gifts and abilities in, but also the spirit of pride, no humility. 
how do you treat or deal with such an one? Um, besides prayer, and we are we are we are you know a prayer ministry, so we always pray for them. But um, I would say there are many ways you could you could um approach that. You, first of all, counsel. And counseling is not necessarily um, sessions. You know, you sit down and you have classes or you have discussions about pride and you know, no. Counseling is just, um, it could be simply just pointing out certain things from the scripture, certain things from life that shows him the error of his ways. But the the even more than counseling i would swing more towards mentoring if you are you know related to that person closely in whatever capacity be a mentor to him or if you or or find him a mentor one who you see elements of a servant leader someone who's humble someone who is you know who exercise love someone who is not selfish is selfless someone who is but 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 walks in power and talks in power and trust me there are people like that and and see if you can um foster a mentoring a uh, relationship in that relationship this person becomes preferably a male because you said a young man right this person now becomes the the follow me as i follow christ to this young man so he now imparts into him and basically duplicates himself into him um that's how i would i would think. I'm, I'm all for mentor mentoring and i also teach a mentoring program which because I really believe, especially, you know, with young people these days, I believe in mentoring. Um, so that's really where I would go. But find someone with a servant heart, with a heart of humility, of love, of selflessness, um, who can mentor. Him. If that's you, praise the Lord, go ahead, mentor him. But if not, if you know, have that time and that um, availability, then find someone else who can. But pray for him and and you know it's just basically just be be that example and place him around examples that he can emulate um and yeah i mean there's a lot more i can say but generally that's what i would that's where i would leave it yeah you can add to that discipleship yeah very important discipleship a lot of things can be corrected when the word is taught without you even having to address it. You understand? Mm -hmm. So discipleship is, is very important. And, and that's where a lot of errors are dealt with, you know, without you even having to address it directly, right? There are some yeah. things that I see, honestly, man of God, mm -hmm. I address it right here at this altar, on this platform through my teaching. And I don't tell the person that is you I address him. Just by my teaching them know, say, look, I need to change this, right? So um, discipleship is important. Yeah. Um, Proverbs 27.5 says, open rebuke, better is open rebuke than even love. There are times when you have to rebuke as well. Absolutely. As a mentor, you will. Yeah. You know, you have to, you know, you can't be caressing certain uh -huh. spirits, right? You have to, you have to rebuke it and rebuke it in love, you know, um, so that the person understands where you're coming from. Um, Revelations chapter 3 and verse 19, this is what Jesus said, I correct and punish the people I love. So show that nothing is more important to you than living right. Change your hearts and lives. So the whole matter of right living, we have to point out right living and point people to Jesus and allow them to see the Jesus standard and model and say, this is what is required of us, you know, as demonstrated to us by Christ. 
Yeah. So you can point out an error without showing the dangers of that error. Yes, Your Honor. You know, so show the dangers of it so that the person will be fully aware of, you know, what they are doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And remember, as a youngster, you're dealing with an egg. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so egg. So everything, everything seasoned very liberally with mm -hmm. love and patience. We mm -hmm. egg. Jesus, mm -hmm. help us, Lord. <clears throat> like, oh, Lord, help us. And if the person needs deliverance, take them through deliverance. Yes, because some people really need deliverance. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to cast out some demons out of them. Because there, there's so, oh, Jesus, there's so much, you know, that is, that is going on. Back mm -hmm. then, you know, a, a person would you know, be born in this world and then is later on the demon them coming them. The demons them now getting inside of them from the egg and the sperm. <laughs> you understand? <clears throat> the demon egg and the demon sperm coming together, you know, to form that child. And you wonder to yourself, where are some of these people, where, where them come from? You know, so deliverance, don't, don't yeah. forget that. Yeah. Mm. It's amazing. <laughs> Amen. Patricia, let's hear from you. Good evening. I'm hiding my cleavage. Okay, don't mind. Okay. <laughs> um, greetings. Um, just a question. Um, going back a little bit to the statement of being practical and yes. moving when necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, I know we're not immature people on the on the on, in this community, but just to add mm -hmm. a statement and end with a question real quick. Um, how do you navigate in a situation where um, you are someone that you pursue knowledge, you pursue information, but God wants you in a situation where the grace on your leader is, for example, humility, but the information that you're pursuing is other than what God wants you to obtain at the moment. And you being practical, you would pursue the, the you pursue knowledge instead of knowing what God wants you to, to, to gain in the moment. Um, how do you navigate as someone, I would call it a stronghold, like you thinking that is what you need. You need information, you need that information. How would you navigate? <coughs> How would you navigate what you need in the moment where it can be a situation that you need to be in a place where you are under a particular grace where you can absorb, um, receive from that grace and not just the pursuit of knowledge? Um, I would I would assume that we maybe get, we get direction from the Holy Spirit. But in your opinion, as an open question, how do you navigate what you pursue? So that you can know what is the practical thing to do. I'm not sure I fully understand the scenario you. Okay, I want to put myself. In the, I'm going to put myself in the situation. Okay, I am pursuing knowledge mm -hmm. and understanding in a particular thing, and I'm feeling like I'm not getting that from my from my pastor. Okay, but God has me in that situation because my pastor is someone that he has a lot of love and I don't have it, for example. Okay. And he wants me to be under that, but my pursuit is knowledge. Um, but I do, I, I do not have the understanding of the difference. I do not know the difference. I have a, and my mind is just fixed on pursuing more knowledge of God. How do you navigate or how do you, how do you give a general statement to to break that how do you how do you give what 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 would you say what would you say to that situation to someone in that situation um i would say generally to everybody i would just say to anybody who finds themselves in you know at, you know in that kind of dissonance where you are yearning for something but the leadership under which you are currently is not giving you that, but is going somewhere else. 
Or like the first question Prophet Bernard asked, you're in that situation where they're not going anywhere, but you want to go somewhere. What, I mean, yeah, we did say be practical and get the hands free. But at the same time, we did say, you know, do it with respect. But also you have to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit as an individual. Because just like you said, you may be there because God is trying to bring something else out of you before he gives you what you desire. You understand? So yeah. he might have you there for a reason, for a purpose. So I would, in as much as I say, get the hands, go. It's still that, that, um, that advice, that suggestion is still subject to the Holy Spirit. Okay, yeah. If I'm understanding, I hope you yes. understood your question. Yes. Right. So it really still is. Um, because if you're not feeling, if you if if even if you're feeling that this is what I want, I, I'm I'm yearning for more, I'm yearning for this, you know, aspect of the Holy Spirit. But your pastor is very strong in this other aspect, and you're also drawn to it, but at the same time, you're yearning. And there's nothing in you that says th that is like, um, how, how do I say it? It's not, there's no conflict, like frustration and I shouldn't be here. Then it probably means the Holy Spirit wants you to remain there and get what he's trying to pour into you in that aspect. And then once you remain obedient to, to the Holy Spirit, once you remain um, obedient to your the leader that he's placed over you, then he will, you know, definitely lead you by himself into where you want to go. And we don't know what else will happen. I did speak about that kind of servant who stays under a leader and gets poured into. Um, Elisha and Elijah was one of the examples I gave. So after Elisha, was poured into and he got everything that he wanted. What happened? Elisha came out and was double what Elijah was because he subjected himself to the spirit of God and to the leadership of Elijah. So, you know, maybe that's, you know, that's that's one way. Prophet Bernard, do you have anything to say? Yes, so, um, so let's go to the Bible. Jesus said, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, I am God's servant, and God will send and post me and appoint me to serve another of his servants. Mm -hmm. I am not um, independent of serving others. Good. Now, if that's the case, even if I'm a pastor, there's going to be a pastor over me, right? Good. And um, because we're all interdependent in some way, shape, or form. Now, you go to the book of Proverbs, it says that a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. Yeah. A lot of times, we have our own mindset as to what we think is best for us. But God is looking at what you are lacking at the core. And he might now attach you to someone who can give you that core and fix that fundamental problem in your core. And you might need to stay with that person for a number of months, a number of years, whatever the time frame is for you to get it, for it to be mm -hmm. fixed. But in your head, this is what you want to pursue. Now, you have to be careful of two things. Spirit of pride, spirit of intellectualism, mm. right? Because these two, they can drive you over a cliff. Many individuals in, in, the, in, in what you're describing, the, the high mountain mentality is what sometimes drives them. They have not been discipled. The basic 
foundational things have not been given to them. And um, they think that, okay, this is what I want and this is what I pursue. No. For instance, um, I might be called to deliverance ministry, but the first teacher I get is not a deliverance minister. Mm -hmm. The first mm -hmm. teacher I probably will get is somebody who will teach me about righteousness, fasting, and prayer. And in my head, I'm like be wondering, what the heck does that have to do with deliverance? I need to know how to identify demons. I need to know how to cast them out. <laughs> I need to know the, 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 the secrets of the underworld. That's what I need to know because God called me to deliverance. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, what you don't know is that the core is what will help you to maintain being a deliverance minister. Yeah. So you have to learn to humble and submit and subject yourself to the person that God connects you to so that whatever God is depositing through that individual might find its way in your heart and help you to become what he wants. Um, I told a story about um, me being at um, UE and I was working there and um, I was researching witches and warlocks and whoever not. In those days, websites are not like it is now. Mm -hmm. There was no um, surface web and deep web and you know, not like that. Everything was open. So I was going, 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 and the Holy Spirit said, Stop. Me, I want to know. That was what was driving me. Holy Spirit said, Stop. I didn't stop. You know what Holy Spirit did? He shot, listen, I found an entrance into a secret society. You understand? On the internet. And I wanted to know so much about these people. But Holy Spirit said, stop. I did not stop. What did he do? He shut down the entire university. No electricity. From Papine down to um, that place there, down to uh, where they are. Um, that hospital, that cancer hospital is August town, come right around the university campus had no light and only one place had electricity. It was the hospital that had electricity. No, you think that's something. Listen this. We had a diesel generator that kicks in when the light goes. We also had a UPS that if the generator fails, there's still light in the building for at least half hour. <laughs> Everything failed. Everything. No light came back for about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. The Lord said, go home. Now listen, I asked him, so why did you do that? He said, listen, I can teach you what you want to know without you having to go to the devil for it. It simply means that God knows what we want, what we need mm -hmm. in the time and season that we are in. We think we know, but God knows what we need. And so we need to submit ourselves to the leadership that God has assigned to our life. Notice how I put it, God has assigned to our life, not the one we choose, the one that God has assigned so that we can be developed in the way that God wants us to, do, to be developed, right? And, and let go of, you know, that mentality that this is what I think I need because then you are self-inflicting yourself there. And we have to be careful about how we think we are better than our leaders because yeah. some people have that mentality too, that they think that, okay, I am better than my leader because I went to, to UWE and he went to online university. So, so I, am, I am better than him. You understand? Or I went to university and he never went to university. So I know more than him and I should be the one teaching him and him not teaching me. Listen, God's grace and anointing is higher than university. Hands down. But we are not despising teaching and instruction. So we have to be careful of pride.
if pride is the reason why you want to run, you need to stay and be delivered. Yeah. Okay. Amen. Merci. Sister Nahilia. Good night, Prophet. Good night, everyone. Good night. Prophet, my question is, right, in our quest for spiritual growth and maturity in leadership, right, how do we as aspiring leaders remain in humility in our quest for um, for growth one and two, how do we not um, let self get involved in our um, way of um, assessing others? Okay. Right. Um, okay. No, 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 it's not anymore. Let me see if I can handle okay. that. Um, humility. Hmm. Well, um, well, let me use the term that Dr. Nadine used. Have the nature of a servant. Have the nature of a servant. And we went into that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, number two, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. You know, don't, don't do that. There is always room for growth. And the more you know is the more you realize you know nothing. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, we did doctorate degrees and we were wondering to ourselves, okay, <laughs> so... <laughs> what is this now? <laughs> what is the purpose of this now? What do I do with this? All of this knowledge that I have gained here. And you realize that you come right back to basics. Just right back around into basics. All it did was just help you to explain things better. You understand? And you realize that, listen, none of this allowed me to know Jesus Christ. Because my, my quest as a Christian is to know Christ and to make him known. So if I want to remain humble, I continue my pursuit of knowing Jesus. Simple. Just continue that pursuit of knowing Jesus and becoming like him and making him known. And you'll find that humility will clothe you because the more you see Christ is the more you see yourself. And you realize that, Lord Jesus, how can a wretch like me be called by God? Am I, am I truly called by God? <laughs> <laughs> Am I truly a prophet? Lord, help me. Prophet? Prophet, Lord, you're sure? <laughs> you understand? Because the more you, you see Christ, is the more you realize that, look, I'm nothing. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, pursue, pursue it in that way. How do you keep yourself from becoming proud and arrogant? Well, learn to honor others. Learn to respect others. Learn to honor the grace on other people's life. Learn to respect where they are at. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Um, if, if you are having angels visiting you every night, glory to God for you. Some of us, we're really trying to understand John 3.16. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> you, are, you are encountering angels. We bless God for you. Amen. <laughs> glory to God. Hallelujah. Some of us, we're trying to even have a good dream. <laughs> At night. Right? So <laughs> learn, just learn to humble yourself and not lord yourself over people, as the Bible says. Yes? Use your wisdom, your knowledge, your grace to help others. Simple. Simple. And, yeah. Go ahead. Doctor. And if you assess yourself first, before you assess the other leader. Hmm. Assess yourself first with the same assessment with which you assess the other leader. Assess mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. Honestly, before God. And once you do that, then you see that there's really nothing mm -hmm. to be proud about. Absolutely. There's nothing to be critical of mm -hmm. or judgmental of. 
in the other leader because yours is the same or maybe worse. Let, let's draw a comparison so, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. two, two, two men, two Ps, Peter and Paul, All right? Peter had no formal education. Man couldn't write to save him life. Um, when they examine his letters, it's bad, it, it, we, we would equate it to bad, bad Greek. <laughs> you understand? The, the E's and the R's are mixed up. The mm -hmm. that has is in the wrong place. You understand? That, that was Peter. He had Mark to help him. Paul, on the other hand, was a learned Pharisee. Mm -hmm. the, man could, the man could construct him thing well. Now here's what Peter said about Paul. He said, this man writes some things that is hard to understand. Could it be hard to understand because Peter just never got school? <laughs> Honestly speaking. <laughs> I mean, leave the spiritual part out of it. Mm -hmm. When you talk about spiritual part, what does Paul have over Peter? Peter was at the Mount of Transfiguration. Don't yeah. forget, Peter mm -hmm. walked on water. So Paul, Paul never had anything spiritual over Peter. Paul just simply had the, the formal educational training over Peter. But then if you compare it again, Peter had Jesus, the greatest teacher. So is there really a comparison? There's, there's really not a comparison. But look at what Peter did. Peter said, you see those letters that Paul wrote? Read them too. Study them too. Listen to what Paul had to say. He wasn't, he wasn't um, afraid to, um, you know, take in the revelations that Paul had. He wasn't afraid to, um, to send that to the churches that he planted. What you see here is a man who had humility and who understand and understood kingdom. And, who, and a man who, who truly emulated what Jesus taught. If you want to be great, become a servant. You understand? So I, I would say, though, you know, and yes, he was not jealous either of Peter, of, of Paul, sorry. So if, if we can reach that stage and really look at the, the, these guys and see how they function and even take a toops out of their book, just a toops in. Can you imagine how, how the church today would be different? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Is there any other question you have? Yes, please, Patrick. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, my other question is, right? As a leader, how do I put this one? As a leader, right? Um, Reverend Nadine would have mentioned that a leader is one that goes after a sheep, right? Yes. Who would have, who would have went astray, correct? Mm -hmm. But in, in uh, my experience, I have not experienced such where persons would normally leave a particular ministry and the leader doesn't find out what happened to that sheep or if everything is okay with that particular individual. And for some reason, one would have then end up back at that same place mm -hmm. and everybody asking certain questions, one. Two, um, what advice would you give to an individual who has been under leadership and been constantly under attack because of the, alt the altar to which that individual is, um, let's say, being a servant to? And how do one... Um, escape such levels of attack? Okay. That's not hard to answer. David was under attack from Saul. Mm -hmm. David ran. <laughs> There's no other 
an explanation for it. If you're on the attack from an altar, none. There is nothing in the Bible that says that you must kill yourself. Yeah, there really isn't. There okay. really isn't. So, you know, you have to develop the will to disconnect. And when the Holy Spirit is speaking, listen. Because he mm -hmm. does speak to us. And many times, because of our misplaced loyalty, we stay to our detriment because fear was driven into our lives. Listen to me. Hear me very well. Mm -hmm. Hear me. Okay? Yes, prophet. Hear your teacher. You are a priest under Jesus Christ as much as they are priests under Jesus Christ. When someone evokes or invokes sorry a, 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 an attack against you in the name of an altar you can evoke your peace put in Christ to negate it and no amount of curse that they release against you can stand their mouth could be anointed like Moses that when it before it finished speaking, the prophecy is, is manifesting. Listen to me. In the priesthood of Christ, of which you're a part, they cannot destroy you. You have to know. You see, we are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. What does a lack of knowledge result in? Strongholds in the mind. Once you rip down that stronghold in the mind mm -hmm. and the fear is gone, it's a different kettle of fish now. Okay? So you have to understand that part. You must know who you are in Christ. Christ is the one who makes you who you are, not me. And if as an, as an under shepherd to Christ, I'm abusing you, you have a right to appeal to Jesus. And Jesus will find a way to deliver you from such. So you have no business staying at an altar where you are being killed. You cannot love your neighbor without loving yourself. Self-love is first. Amen? Amen. Good. All right. Don't have nothing more to say about that. Sister Alicia Rose. Mm. And I saw Sister oh. Fanny, and that's it. Good Go night. Do I have to turn my camera on? <laughs> okay. Do I have to? I will if I have to. Uh, well, we want oh. you to. Okay. Okay. I'll turn it on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, I'm here. Hi, Dr. Thomas. How are you? I'm good. You know, Thank you. I'm not a burnout, but it's me. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, hey. uh, a question for you. Um, um, a minister that um, works, um, he is not um, supported by the ministry because it's a small ministry. Yes. And um, his work is beginning to interfere with his leadership. Um, and um, you try to bring that up, but in honesty, he has a family and he has to work. So it's kind of frustrating for him. And um, the ministry also um, forced me into a position of leadership, you know, which is which is the good part. Um, I'm doing things that I never thought that I could do, you know, that allows me that. But um, I see this minister being swamped by his job to provide for um, his family and the ministry suffers spiritually you know, and um, 
how, how, how can a minister find the balance? Because there has to be a balance. How does he go about that? Dr. Thomas, do you want to? Um, I remember when my first full-time ministry, my first initial foray into full-time ministry, my then leader um, sat me down one day and he said, how do you perceive your being here? Do you see it as career or do you see it as a ministry? And, um, and I think that every leader has to determine that. Um, how do you see your position? Is, is it a career or is it a ministry? Because um, there are vocational pastors. My pastor position is a vocation, it's a career, is what I do. I love God, I love God's people. I can manage an organization, so that's what I'm doing. And trust me, he loves God. He loves working with God people, but it's a career. Um, but when a, a, men, a, a pastor sees his position as a minister, then I have to be careful how I say this, but the ministry becomes his priority. And... Um, and then just like you said, he has to create that balance so that his family doesn't fall apart. So they don't suffer, but at the same time, the ministry can't fall apart either. So what does he do? Um, one of the servants that I spoke about was that kind um, of servant, the servant who was into full-time ministry. It, I mean, it was vocational. This is all he does is pastor the church. <clears throat> I'm just very careful how I answer this because there are those who believe that um, a, per, a pastor, a leader of a church can have a job that can run a business while he runs the church. And some people do it. But what I find most times is that the church suffers. And I think I'm rambling because I really don't want to strike. I leave mm -hmm. that striking to Pastor Bernard. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> But most times what happen, the business will not suffer. The job will not suffer. It's the church that suffers. Um, do I say should all pastors, should I then say all pastors should be full-time ministry and not going to business or not going to job? I can't make that blanket statement. But I believe that if you have answered the call, you just have to know as a pastor, what is it that God called you for? If God calls you to start a church or to be head of a church, a flock, then you have to be in that place where you trust him to provide. Because a lot of times when pastors venture out profit to start a business, it's because they are fear. Yes. It's because of fear. It is, and, and you cannot have that level of fear and say, I trust God. Mm -hmm. You don't decide what to trust God for and with and what not to. So then you're trusting God to make your business boom, but you can't trust God to make your oh. church stable and grow and oh. develop. I can't yeah. tell you what to say to your pastor, but that's just my thoughts on the matter. Um, I don't like to knock heads and nail you know, nails on the head, I leave that to the prophet. Please, prophet, go ahead. Can okay. I do something also? Hold, hold on, hold on, hold, hold on. Don't, don't go any further. We hold that thought, right? Let's deal with this. Um, Pastor Diana, I need to buy a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm ready to knock matters, I'm going to lift up my hammer. Amen. <laughs> now that's a light moment. Um, uh, Sister Rose, let's look at some things. Ministry and career as... Um, Dr. Thomas is saying, I must know the scope of my call. What is God calling me to? I must know that. Okay? Now, let me use my own life. 
and as a, as a, as example it's my life i can use it when god called me i was working full time the calling of god was on my life before that but god said now come to me i want you here i said okay what does that look like how will i take care of my family <clears throat> The response was, trust me. I will provide for you. I said, okay. Now I have to proceed on that word. Now watch this now. I am not called first and foremost to be independent. Ooh. <laughs> Usually God, when he calls you, he connects you to somebody. That person would have been ahead of you. So that person would have cushioned you in certain things. <clears throat> right? That's not how it works these days. <clears throat> but he connects you first so that you are cushioned. So that there are some things that you do not have to face in the initial stage of your call. Elisha was a prophet called by God, but he was cushioned by Elijah, who already had certain things going for him, a school, um, a place of provision, and all of that kind of stuff. So he never had to face the whole going out there to fend for himself kind of. But what is happening today is that many people who are called by God are not being cushioned by anyone. Okay, uh, it could be because, again, the pride factor, I want to do this by myself, I want to build my own empire, I don't want to have nobody influencing me, so there's no cushion. And it could also be that you are, you either disconnect from your cushion or didn't connect to your cushion. Good? Now, how God calls you, you must know. Did he call you to be bivocational or did he call you to be full-time as in, you know, how I operate? You must know that before you start because this journey is a faith one that, listen, you can't put your hand to it and take it back. And whether you're bivocational or not, you're going to have moments where there are going to be lows. Are you going to run? Mm -hmm. Now it's 20 years since full-time ministry for me. And I have not gone back into secular work. I'm using those terms for understanding. Mm -hmm. How did I survive? How? I was connected to a cushion and the cushion was pulled. <laughs> <laughs> How did I survive? That, mm. how, 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 what kept my wife with me? How did I maintain my sanity? Jehovah God, it's a lot. What kept me was faith. <clears throat> faith, just believing God that look, God called me and he will not embarrass me. That's God right. called me and he will not put me to shame. Did I have moments of low? Oh, yes. Did I have moments when I felt like this wasn't it? Oh, yes. Did I make steps and efforts to go and do something else? Oh, yes. Did it work? Oh, no. <laughs> I remember the last time I was, I was discombobulated and a job was being provided. And I prayed and I said, Lord, you see if this is what you, if this is not what you want. I said, let the man call me and tell me that he don't want me. Listen, <laughs> the man call me and tell me say he don't want me. That, that, that's the kind of relationship we have, I have with God. And you must have a relationship with God to know so that what he has called you to will not suffer. Because the ministry is not 
my, and I'm going to use these words now, is not my career, it's God's assignment. The ministry is God's assignment, even though what I do now becomes my career. It's not my career first, it's God's assignment. And if it's God's assignment, then will God not provide? Is either I'm going to provide or I'm not going to provide? Mm -hmm. It's a simple thing. I'm, I, we have to be black and white there. So. Now, again, you have to look at, you can't look at everything blanket. You have to deal with it case by case. You have to look <clears> at <throat> this past as a case by case situation. Did he start this thing too early, too quick? How did he start? What is, you know, you have to look at all of these things because there are some things, my friend, that God is not in because we have run ahead of him. <coughs> run ahead of him. 2019, the Lord spoke to me very clearly. He said, you will not travel in 2020. I said, God, what? I said, what well, you mean by I will not travel? I said, you know, and I started to give him all kinds. I said, you know that when I travel and, 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 and they call me to come and do some little things, that's how I get a little dollar and whatnot, not. Dead silent. Dead silent. You will not travel. Then by the time February, we start hearing about COVID. By the time March, everywhere locked down. And that's when God came back and spoke to me three months after. He said, well, if you had traveled, you would not have been able to come back into your country. Listen, me no one know what that mean. You will not have been able to come into your country, back, come back into your country. You know, that could have mean something could have been dead out there or very well stuck out there, whichever one it not pretty. Yeah. Then April of 2020, God said, open the glory room. I said, how? And he began to give instructions. And this is what you have today from just being obedient to God and listening to him. Three years later, have I been supplied by God? Absolutely. He has taken care of me. Like Jamaicans would say, take shame out of me. I. Is this the end of me? No. So you, you have to know, honestly, what God has called you to do so that you do not become an embarrassment <clears throat> to God by doing things that bring God's name in disrepute. The ministry must never suffer. Never. I wanted to ask though, um, Mr. Rose, um, how has the how has this this change, this shift, um, impacted the church? Um, um, let me. I was going to go to that. Let me explain something to you. When I came on board, um, yes, build the church. We have built the church, like built our, our own building, our own property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is, is accomplished the physical infrastructure, that part. Yes. Um, he, he, he worked for others throughout the years and um, we'd give him more time for the ministry, but now he's tired of working for others. So the inception of his own business was to give himself more time for the ministry. But the devil had to flip the switch. And, and this business has taken up so much of his time, like so much of his time that the, the, I see the spiritual aspect of the church is um, suffering. Um, we have lost members and, um, you know, it's just falling away. And um, sometimes I'm in doubt of, of myself as a leader because I wonder if it's by default or it's God's assignment, you know, I um this 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 lack of attention to the ministry has, has quite caused quite spiritual harm to the church. I must tell you that it has. And um me, I was in the entertainment industry and I didn't walk away from it as a young, a young girl. 
I walk up, walked away from it in my 40s, my middle 40s. You know, so it was, it was quite a, 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 a harsh decision for me because the calling of God was on my life in so much ways that there was no gray area. Is it that I serve God or do what I do? And the um, um, choice for, for, I spent all my life in entertainment. And so I didn't acquire a profession, just new entertainment. And, um, and so I work, I work now, I work, I work. And um, sometimes <laughs> I say, God, are you, are you humbling me or are you humiliating me? You know, it's uh, this, the, the, what, what I understood from the transition is that the, um, the, the secular world and the, the um, kingdom of God, um, what I gather, the, the ministry is so much different. And um, for, for years, I didn't sing because I couldn't understand the transition. Um, but now in, in, in teaching the word of God and in understanding certain things, I understand that, you know. So I am able to, to minister also through music freely. You know, not 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 as a not as a as a job, you know. And yeah. that's, that's, that's as fine a with ministry. Me. As a ministry. So, and, so and, and, and that's with me. But my church suffers from the, the lack of uh, attention from my minister because he's so caught up in in um in earning a living. In building his business. Himself. So Prophet, what I'm getting is that he's been working since mm -hmm. the inception of the ministry right but recently he went into full-time and you see what this is the classic case of the sheep the sheep the, shepherd, the sheep without shepherd mm -hmm. um oh they, I, must, I must i must i must explain something before you go further when he decided to do that he came to he came to me and um he said um I'm thinking of handing over the church to somebody else to, um, to run because I think I'm going to be so busy. And so I asked him, I asked him, I came on, on board this ministry because of, of what you said God wanted you to do. You're going to inject somebody else in this ministry. Does that mean the assignment that God gave you is finished? And I said, if you do such a thing, then I'll be forced to walk away. I am going to walk away because this is telling me that this is this, 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 either you're disobedient to God or this ministry in the first place was your idea. Mm. And, and I said, you need to think carefully before you make such a decision. I'm, I'm finished there. Yeah. Yeah, um, this looks like a matter for private consultation. Um, I probably need to book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, we can learn from this though, because yeah. what's happening is, is a, is a sheep, is a, is a, is a flock mm -hmm. without a shepherd. Absolutely. So you mentioned the spiritual, the quant qualitative um, disintegration the um you know the spiritual level of the church has you know gone down the numerical the quality the quantitative um aspect of the church and the uncertainty in um next tier leadership so there is no security there is no empowerment because once you're second guessing your leadership then you are not empowered mm -mm. Right. Um, so, so you, because you yourself, um, you're also in that stage of development. So you're being forced now to develop yourself and at the same level, develop others, which that really was not the kind of leadership that God wants, that Jesus demonstrated. He was fully developed. He was developed as he developed others. So it is, I mean, this is a great um, case study, Prophet. Yes. 
a great now, case study. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say something here because <laughs> there are other people here who have similar situations I'm, yeah, I believe that you are that. describing, Alicia, similar. Um, there's, there's one case now where a church is about to be shut down um, by, a similar, by a similar situation, a mm. bad decision-making, um, you know, I don't want to go into it. Now, the Bible says something. First John 2, 15. Love not the world, mm. neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. <laughs> now, um, there is there is something I wrote in this book, um, Victorious Spiritual Warfare, right? I wrote an entire chapter on the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and how the enemy attacks. One of the things that I have, I'm beginning to see is that when it comes to the pride of life, people want to leave a name and a legacy. And um, how they constitute that in their minds is that leaving a name and a legacy means that I have something tangibly built yeah. <laughs> in order to leave that name and legacy. <laughs> And um, once they accomplish that, they feel like they have done their due diligence in, you know, etching their names in the sands of time and they mm -hmm. move on. And you wonder to yourself, okay, how does that work in the minds of those who say they are called by God? Does God, is, is God's calling truncated by time? Is there a demarcation on it? Absolutely not assignments have demarcations of time god's calling does not now you find that what i've seen is that a number of people who have the capacity to attract wealth whether financial wealth or resources they do not stay in places to help the ones that god has called but they call themselves <laughs> And it, they fabricate the spiritual jargon surrounding it. And then go out, start and do, and then truncate it and mess up other people. Because many of us don't know how to discern between charisma, gift, and mantle. We, we, we don't know how to discern these things. So we get attracted to the fact that, oh, but it seems like God really called this one because the resources are coming in, the finances are coming in, the building is mm -hmm. being built. So, so God must call this one. But no, God never called that one. <laughs> this one was called to help the one that God called because they have the anointing to attract the wealth. And you will, the, the anointing will draw them, the grace on their life will draw them to where the grace needs to work. So if the grace is business, then they'll be drawn to business. Look where they are being drawn and you know where they are being called. And so we, we have a real problem, Alicia. A real problem. Yeah. Honestly, we have a real problem. Yeah. Right? Some, some are called, for example, to be apostles. Go out there, plant the church, hand it over. And move on, yeah. And yeah. move on. Mm -hmm. Right? But then they plan the church, stay there, mess it up, and end up messing up people's life. Three, four times the church names changed. Why? Mm. Because you're not supposed to stay here. So you're supposed to be moving. Mm. Plant it, hand it over, move on. Then when your planting season is done, now become the apostle that imparts. Mm. Because God always have a place for you. Always. But again, the high mountain mentality. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the things, I mean, um, I feel sometimes it's a scary thing, is that, you know, it's for me to sit here and hear that and make a case study of it. But most times I am inside the pastor's office and I'm talking to the leaders. And it is then that the Holy Spirit can reveal exactly what is going on. Do you belong here? Um, is it like Prophet said, 
your 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 calling is apostolic you should have just built this church put it in the hand of the pastor that God appointed or you know call for this and move on go build another one or go where else God sends you or are you have you um gone away Mm -hmm. have you put your hand to the plow and gone back so it's it's you know unless you know me in my capacity is sitting there talking with the leaders and getting that sense of the holy spirit sometimes it's difficult because i'd have to hear from him um we you know because then it it informs the whole thing yeah. but it it like prophet said it can be many scenarios but um, I'm trusting God that as you continue to be obedient to God and submit submit to him until the Holy Spirit says otherwise, that he'll begin to reveal what steps to take. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. This one still needs some private consultation. So it does. <laughs> It absolutely does. Well, well let's yeah. take Sister Pani the final question and then we're done for tomorrow. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening. Sister Pani. Um, Dr. Pastor Prophet. <laughs> <laughs> um, what happened? I was going through what you said about the Old Testament leaders, right? Mm -hmm. The qualities. Mm -hmm. And then you said the New Testament leaders have to look to Christ. Mm -hmm. But you find in the Old Testament, the leaders did very well. They It's like they were exemplary leaders. Mm -hmm. Now, in the New Testament, what is what is the difference? In other words, you said in the, is a servant shepherd. But what is the what is the, 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 the mark, the difference between these two leaders, the Old Testament and the New Testament? Because I'm saying you can emulate what is in the Old Testament leaders. They have done, some of them have had good qualities. Absolutely. So uh -huh. um, in the New Testament, how it's true you have to look to Christ, but you find a lot of leaders don't exhibit those qualities mm. that you find in the Old Testament leaders, like obedience, humility, faith, consistency, and things like that. So how do you come? Yeah. How do you... Um, would I say that? I know what you're asking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How does that relate? Okay. Um, I did say that Old Testament leaders exhibit qualities of a servant mm -hmm. leader, of, of servant leadership. Um, the difference with Old Testament leaders and New Testament leaders is that um New Testament leaders um follow the teaching and the example of Jesus Christ, who actually lived servant leadership. So his life, his lifestyle mm -hmm. um, um, exemplified the servant leader. It taught servant leadership. Now from his lifestyle, from his example, we could see elements of characteristics, of qualities, within Old Testament leaders. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, so we can, I mean, we can categorically say that at, an Old Testament leader was a servant leader, but there are mm -hmm. so many elements of servant leadership. We could see that they led while they served. And I think one of the greatest, if I were to pick one servant leader, so to speak, from the Old Testament is Nehemiah. I mean, mm -hmm. this man literally was a leader as he was a servant, the two in one body standing right there by the wall. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't really live servant leadership. They exemplified, they, I mean, they, they, they demonstrated attributes and qualities, but Jesus Christ himself mm 
Mm -hmm. um, exemplify. So we can see the what of servant leadership in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see the who, because Jesus Christ is that who, and everyone who follows him, who imitates him, mm -hmm. is a who of servant yeah. leadership. Absolutely. So they embody the whole thing. He yeah. he just he was just a servant leader. Mm -hmm. And from his life, then that's how we define servant leadership. That's how we practice and demonstrate servant leadership. Mm -hmm. okay. Understand, Clara? Understand, Clara. Okay. If, if you look at the, the Old Testament, guys, what you'll find is also types, typologies, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. each, each one of them, they are a type of Christ in some way. Yeah. Not the fullness, but a type. So you, you will find like in David is the shepherd king. But in Jesus, you, you see it fully. Mm -hmm. Right. In Moses, he's the uh, Moses is the servant deliverer. But in Jesus, you see it fully. You, you'll oh, find yeah. what you'll find is that you'll find failures in these Old Testament guys in Jesus. There is none. Those failures don't exist. Right. So where they failed, Jesus, you know, was victorious and we see the fullness of it. Now, you, you, you also you were mentioning something about, you know, the why the Old Testament guys were able to lead so well versus mm -hmm. the New Testament guys. Right. One of the things I okay. saw is 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 that in the Old Testament. When God revealed himself to these guys, there is an accompanying supernatural thing that takes place. So, you know, whether some sign and wonder yeah. that mm -hmm. will, you know, these guys, they're beyond the shadow of a doubt. They know that God called them. Mm. You understand? Mm -hmm. so, look at Gideon, for example. Look mm -hmm. at Moses. There Moses. Mm -hmm. Look at Jeremiah. God mm -hmm. appeared to these guys. Look yeah. at Isaiah. The train of his robe filled his temple. Who don't want that? Eh? <laughs> as much as it is scary, me, I would have loved it. <laughs> you understand? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know the, the, the supernatural encounters that these guys had was but, beyond. And I think, so hold on, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Hold your mm -hmm. thought. I don't want to lose mine. When you come into the New Testament, and I'm bringing it to us here present day generation we don't have that kind of supernatural thing we don't have that we have premonitions inspirations desires of god's call and we pursue that mm -hmm. we, we, most of us don't get that angelic visitation and fire and all that. we don't get that we, we mm -hmm. sense a calling of god on our life and we pursue it and we realize say yes yeah, true god did call me in the Old Testament. Yeah, our substance is hope. <laughs> hope and Evidence faith. is not seen. <laughs> not seen. <laughs> In the Old Testament, Christ is revealed to us by his word. If, if you look at how most of us pursue our calling, it is after we have gotten an understanding of the word that many of us begin to pursue. Under normal yeah. circumstances, we not pursue nothing. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. You understand? Uh -uh. It's the word of God being given to us at some level that causes us to begin to desire and pursue, you know, some level of calling and relationship with God in that realm. Which is why it is important that we get a revelation of Jesus before we even begin to pursue anything called calling. Mm. honestly speaking because that is what will sustain you mm -hmm. when the going gets tough when people walk away from you when they tell you give me the church and hand over the house your time is up you understand when 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 they tell you you're hearing from demons leave mm. when they disconnect you from their network and their pyramid what are you going to do? Is your calling done and you're going to pursue business now or something else? But your revelation of Christ keeps you going, keeps you pursuing. 
that call that God has for you. So the difference, I think, um, you know, in my addition, the, these Old Testament guys needed the supernatural signs. We don't need it because Christ is already come. What we need is an understanding of the word and pursue by faith. It's the same thing these guys did. Yeah. They pursued by faith. Look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah at one time bawled and said, God, you, you sure you call me? Me not talk in your name again. <laughs> and God just light the fire. I feel like a fire shut up in my bones. And Jeremiah began to bounce. <laughs> you understand? So, you know, it, it's all by faith. It's all by faith. So we should be further ahead than those Old Testament guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Way. way ahead. Because here, here is what we have. Those Old Testament guys never had the Jesus revelation, first and foremost. Mm. But they were being set as examples for us. Now, look at this. If God chose you to be an example, God help you, you know. Mm -hmm. God help you because, listen, <laughs> being an example is not easy. It's not easy. Okay, the person mm -hmm. who is coming after you is going to be better than you because he has your story. Sure. So now those guys were set as examples. Now Jesus came, the fullness, and showed us how all of those examples tied into one another. Now we have a picture of Jesus Christ and the, and, and the one to follow. Now we look to him, the author and finisher of our faith. Good? We have the full word No, We can go from Genesis to Revelation. Those guys never have no word other than what God revealed to them. Sometimes God talked to them this month and him not come back till three years time. Mm -hmm. We know we have the full Bible. We can go from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, what God says about faith. Abraham never known nothing where God said about faith, but other than go bring your son, come up a Mount Mara, we're going to sacrifice him to them. <laughs> and he just had to obey that. And trust that him gonna come back down with him son. So he does it mean we have understood? Sorry? sorry. Does it Even mean we have that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Sister Fanny. No, does it mean we have understood that this word is important in our lives? Very important. Does it mean Absolutely. we haven't captured that? We haven't captured it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It is the okay. central core foundation, wall, building, pillar, everything. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. Look at, look at how um, beautifully Dr. Thomas looked at the nine categories of servant, servants in the Bible. Right? Mm -hmm. And showed you, look, nine different areas. Ser service is not just one area. Look at how many different places and ways that God calls mm -hmm. servants. Mm -hmm. Right, we have that today because they are examples gone ahead of us. What if you were the example? No. So you can't you can't quarrel with Moses when him strike the rock when he's supposed to um speak to it. You can't mm -hmm. quarrel with um um what's his name um Jephthah when Jephthah says anything will come meet me I eat my sacrifice. You, can, you can't quarrel with him. You can't quarrel mm -hmm. with Jonah who wanted to run. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? We now have the full story. They never have the full story. What if we are also being made examples in Christ? Didn't isn't that what Paul said that we are being made spectacles to the world? Mm -hmm. So what if we too are being made examples? Mm -hmm. do, do you have the option of saying to God, God, I don't want to be an example? <laughs> yeah. Are you following me? Yeah. So when we look at these things, we have to tremble with fear. Yeah, I think we've taken everything so lightly. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. much so. We Very have to lightly. just tremble with fear inside of us. We do. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Oh. Mm -hmm. Help us, Jesus. Anyway, I think that's where we have to stop tonight. Um, yeah. There's a lot to ponder on, a lot for us to go and um, chew on and just allow the Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts and our minds. Dr. Thomas, we thank you again for tonight, for, for stirring the, 
pot of revelation <laughs> and opening up the realms of the spirit to us by God's grace. Amen.